Greetings to our valued ACAM members. We're delighted to have you here. Today we have the pleasure of hosting nurse practitioner Ariel Kazi. The format for today will consist of the feature presentation by nurse practitioner Kazi and then a question and answer section. Throughout the presentation, if you do have any questions, please post them to the right in the chat section and they'll be answered at the appropriate time. Next, I would like to introduce today's featured speaker, nurse practitioner Ariel Kazi. She's currently a clinical instructor at West Coast University in California and is extremely involved in the education, development, and nurturing of new nurses on the forefront of discovering and implementing new methods of patient care and treatment. Dr. Ms. Kazi? Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna turn my video on so you guys can see me. Um, like he said, I'm a nurse practitioner. Um, I've been a nurse for many years. I've been in and around integrative medicine for about 15, 16 years now. So um, uh, I have been around it. I've been utilizing these protocols and techniques for quite some time and they um, seem to get really good results. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get into my presentation here. Um, so today's talk, um, we're gonna be going over the gut, the basis of health. Um, and I do wanna give a little, uh, preface to uh, today's discussion. Um, in case there's any additional background noise, I apologize in advance, but uh, if you guys need me to, I can uh, uh, hold off or repeat what I say if uh, the background noise is too much. So this was a lecture that was given uh, last year's uh, Nashville presentation as well. So it did have CME credits at that time, but um, currently uh, I don't know that this has any attached to the webinar. So our objectives for today, um, we're going to be talking about um, some of the key elements of the gastrointestinal system. So essentially speaking, what the role is inside of the body in terms of how our GI system affects our whole body healing. Um, we're going to talk about different digestive conditions, common symptoms, side, uh, and uh, signs and symptoms, review some of the diseases and the pathophysiology related behind them. Um, look at some traditional treatments that we've been using to help manage some of these diseases and then look at adjunctive or um, alternative therapies that we can use. And then I'm also gonna review a few um, prominent case studies that I've done um, regarding um, the patient's conditions and their outcomes. So we're gonna start off pretty much by looking at the individual roles inside the gut. So digestion of food, absorption of nutrients, medications, how our immune system and gut are so closely um, related to each other, looking at neurotransmitter balance and activity and how that really has a, a key factor in how our gut functions and how it works um, throughout the rest of our body and how the elimination of waste is high, highly important and key to um, proper functioning of our digestive system. So a couple quick things. I know a lot of uh, the people on here have medical backgrounds, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going into great detail on this, but just a few quick points looking at the differences between mechanical and chemical digestion. So again, starting in the mouth, using the tongue and teeth to break food down, the use of enzymes and saliva to help uh, aid in that process, um, the peristalsis of the esophagus and the opening and closing of the pyloric sphincter and stomach. Um, so primarily, um, most mechanical digestion is gonna be done in the mouth and the stomach itself where the food is churned um, or medications are churned with the use of enzymes and hydrochloric acid to help break it down. Um, and then several things can either be absorbed through the, the lumen, either of the stomach, but typically the jejunum, and we'll get into absorption a little bit later. Um, but mechanical digestion is predominantly done there. Um, chemical digestion is usually done a little bit more throughout the entire process. Um, it can include enzymes, hydrochloric acid, um, and bile production, um, as we all know, is uh, produced by the liver and excreted by gallbladder, should the patient still have one. Um, and helps to aid in the breakdown of the food into nutrients and electrolytes that can easily be absorbed through digestive lining. Um, so looking at the absorption of different nutrients and medications, I think it's important just to um, review this slightly um, so that it plays a role in what we're looking at and when we're looking at um, things that go wrong in the gut and when we look at repairing the gut. Um, so a lot of times um, patients I see who have chronic um, electrolyte imbalances tend to have gut issues and absorption issues. So the majority of electrolytes are absorbed in the jejunum or small intestine using sodium transporters and passive transport. Um, so there's a high amount of uptake of our smaller electrolyte sodium potassium chloride 
and a moderate to low uptake of minerals um, that can occur in, in those places as well. Um, so it's important that we're looking at that as part of our role in terms of the whole picture we're seeing with our patients and how we can appropriately address um, any concerns that are going on. So um, specifically in patients I might see with things like acid reflux or GERD, they tend to have some electrolyte imbalances as well. Water is absorbed throughout, um, through osmosis. Um, and on average, we should be drinking somewhere between seven to nine liters a day unless on some type of uh, fluid restriction for the patient. Um, and it definitely aids in the motility and breakdown of food, um, helps with some of the mechanical digestion as well. And then vitamins, it depends on uh, what their composition is. So water soluble or absorbed in the stomach or small intestine. So those would be like your B vitamins, vitamin C, and then fat soluble vitamin uh, A, E, D, and K um, are going to be um, upon the release of lipase and then um, with the use of bile in the small intestines. Um, and these are the ones that are harder to transport um, through the intestinal wall um, and high levels um, can lead to toxicity. I just really like this graphic because it gives a good presentation or picture of what's going on inside the body and where we're actually picking things up from our digestive system. So protein amino acids um, typically are gonna be broken down by proteolytic enzymes um, and then uh, degraded into smaller structures that can go across the substrates of the small intestines. Lipids um, is gonna be through luminal absorption um, with the use of bile. Um, and allows fatty acid clusters to bind into um, the lumen and exchange fat cholesterol into cellular cytosol. Um, carbohydrates are transported through the membrane of the small intestine through um, sodium potassium ATPase, ATPase transporters. Um, and fructose can also pass through the lumen of membranes via passive transport on a gradient scale. And the medications, it just depends on their mechanism of action, their coding, the type of medication and their expected delivery system. So uh, when we're looking at gut health, um, one of the big things that comes up is going to be um, problems with our immune system and our immune defenses. So when the immune system um, is threatened in some way, um, we're going to either see a side effect of some gut um, or GI symptoms, or as a result of gut or GI symptoms, we're going to end up having more problems with our immune system. So about 70 to 80 percent of our immune system sit inside of our gut. So we have some of our innate barriers like our skin and our mucus um, that we produce, but we also have some helpful agents like commensal bacteria that live inside there. So our gut flora, um, which I'll go into more detail on, um, but they uh, definitely are a large portion of our innate immune system. And then white blood cells. Um, so high amounts of neutrophils, macrophages, mast cells, dendritic cells are in high concentration in the gut and some lymphocytes. We predominantly see IgE and IgA antibodies that typically line the gut. Um, and uh, when we see patients with high amounts of food allergies, we're gonna see a large influx in those antibodies, obviously, but usually it's because of some failed mechanism uh, that we will illustrate later uh, in regards to the basic immune functioning. And then things like hydrochloric acid or the bile um, are also part of our uh, immune defenses that exist within our gut. So neurotransmitter balance and activity. activity. Um, most of our neurotransmitters are actually produced by gut flora. Um, so there's a link between long-term flora disrepair and the development of certain psychiatric conditions like depression, anxiety. There's even been studies that have linked um, uh, gut flora imbalance to things like schizophrenia um, and uh, the progression of things like Alzheimer's, dementia, or Parkinson's. Um, so our, our gut flora produces about 70% of the neurotransmitters we have inside of our body and is highly influenced by the diet that we eat. So those could include things like eggs, tofu, turkey, chicken. Um, a lot of protein uh, ends up being broken down into things like serotonin, um, uh, dopamine, uh, melatonin, um, and there's also things like GABA, acetylcholine, um, even histamine-based reactions that can occur. Um, based on the foods that we're eating and the production from the gut flora. Um, similarly, like we said, so we can either see the development of psych certain psychiatric conditions or even just symptoms of the disorder. So um, predominantly in patients that I see with significant gut repair, I have a lot of anxiety, depression, and insomnia. Um, on occasion, I will see patients with delusions, paranoia, um, 
hallucinations are probably on the more rare side, but can still occur um, because they are affecting exactly how our brain is communicating and how our cells and nerves are, are communicating with each other. So this slide is looking at the connection between the gut-brain axis. So essentially speaking, um, everything that happens within our gut system um, is going to have an effect on our brain as well because of all of those reasons I just mentioned. So um, if, as the main factor in producing things like uh, acetylcholine, GABA, um, serotonin, um, the foods that we eat is gonna have a massive impact on the rest of the body and exactly how it regulates things like cytokines and some of the other uh, neuropeptides and neurohormones that we release. Um, so uh, the example on the right there is showing um, a diet high in meat, high fat food, sugar, um, additives or antibiotics cause a significant breakdown to the gut flora that should be present and producing the high amounts of neurotransmitters that we're looking for. Over time, it can lead to neurodegeneration um, uh, poor conduction of electrical impulses um, and cause quite quite a significant problem with inside the body, not just um, on a neurologic standpoint, but also in some of our other um, neuroendocrine or cell signaling pathways. Uh, on the left-hand side, probiotics, prebiotics, fermented foods, which have both of those in them, beans or whole grains, um, can help to feed this and actually help with things like neuroregeneration um, and improve a uh, nerve conduction or cellular conduction. Um, we can see the reduction of uh, the production of certain cytokines. Um, we can reduce inflammation, uh, not only in the brain, but systemically through dietary modifications. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as that goes on. So importance of the elimination of waste is obviously the removal of toxins or waste products that we normally need to get rid of elimination of medications or their byproducts or metabolites, and then water and electrolyte balance. Um, probably one of uh, my favorite questions with my patients is, did you poop today? Um, how many times would it look like? Uh, generally though, I do not want to see pictures. So um, although some of my patients are kind enough to take uh, photographs and uh, share so kindly with me. Some of the most common digestive conditions we can find in our patients would be things like GERD or acid reflux, peptic ulcer disease, nausea, vomiting, a lot of electrolyte imbalances, although this doesn't necessarily have to be gut in origin, but it could be. Um, constipation and diarrhea are always signs to look at gut health. Um, Crohn's ulcerative colitis and a whole slew of other um, inflammatory bowel diseases, food allergies um, and infections. Um, are things we're gonna spend a little more time on. And then there's also um, external um, or systemic manifestations that we can see as well that are digestive conditions as a root. So uh, chronic fatigue syndrome has shown um, a link between something called leaky gut, and I will go over that later in this presentation as well. Um, we can also see um, large scale eczema, psoriasis, poorly controlled acne, psychiatric disorders, um, and a few other things, including uh, cancer. So in general, uh, when we're looking at the things that can affect the gut, um, there are several areas in which we can focus in on. The ones I'm gonna be focusing in on today are gonna be more towards infections um, and inflammation in the gut and how we can go about getting rid of those so that we can have a truly healthy gut. So uh, when we're looking at various infections, there are different types, obviously. So viral um, generally are very time limited, but could have long-term or chronic disease states. Um, typically, we would see things like adenovirus, rotavirus, norovirus. You could also have um, hepatitis, I suppose, included in there, depending upon how significant or severe it was um, or the type. Um, so those could be resolved or could have some chronic manifestations. Bacterial um, typically comes from poor hygiene or contaminated food um, and usually can be resolved with antibiotics, but uh, sometimes they can be quite significant and result in death. Um, we can see things like E. coli, Shigella, Salmonella, uh, C. diff or SIBO. Um, and SIBO is one of the infections I'll be highlighting in this presentation as well. And then fungal infections, I would say are pretty common um, and a lot of providers don't tend to suspect them. 
Uh, they don't show up on any fecal or blood testing um, unless there's a severe infection or the patient is for some reason shedding uh, the fungus itself. So in some cases, if they're on a treatment for fungal infections, you may see some in the stool, but it's pretty rare. Uh, it can be difficult to treat um, because there's a wide variety of symptoms. And so sometimes we go towards treating the symptom versus the patient. Um, and it's hard to always, because of testing being limited, it's hard to always determine if that's the absolute root cause. So individuals with susceptibility are patients who have recently been on antibiotics, anyone who has a suppressed immune system, um, people with poor diets, uh, other prior gastrointestinal infections, so viral or bacterial. Um, most commonly, we tend to see candida, but there's aspergillus and several other uh, fungal infections that can occur in the gut. Um, and then lastly, uh, parasitic infections, and they frequently occur with contaminated food. Um, there's a high susceptibility to concurrent infections. So typically speaking in the patients, I have found parasitic infections for um, through stool testing. Um, more commonly, I also find that they have fungal infections. So um, we'll kind of go over how the fungus can disrupt the internal barrier on the gastrointestinal tract and can end up causing um, a higher susceptibility to bacterial, parasitic, or viral infections in them of themselves. Uh, common infections we could potentially see would be giardia, pinworms, flukes, um, various types of amoebas, hookworms, etc. So small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO is what it's commonly called. Um, this is typically an overgrowth of uh, intestinal flora that was supposed to be there. Um, but due to some other factor, it has overgrown to a point where it is no longer commensal with our body or providing a helpful relationship. So um, in these cases, patients tend to become very symptomatic. Um, some of the things that increase their risk for developing SIBO uh, would be low GI motility, um, sometimes through medications that they're taking that slow that down. Um, recent or recurrent use of antibiotics. Um, so it's killed off some of the other beneficial bacteria and only left certain ones left standing. So they have a tendency to overgrow. Um, autoimmune diseases like lupus, scleroderma, IBS, um, anyone with low stomach acidity, uh, patients who've had recent abdominal surgeries, um, and then patients with uh, poor enzyme activity like diabetes. Um, if they're older in age, typically females have a higher tendency towards SIBO and then long-term use of PPIs um, or proton pump inhibitors. So a lot of the symptoms are going to be um, either near uh, the stomach or in the small intestine space. So um, upper abdominal pain or patient reports stomach pain. Uh, they can have nausea, constipation, or diarrhea. I think one of the key things that I tend to see with patients is the weight loss and the bloating. Um, and the bloating will come um, pretty quickly after the consumption of food. So uh, I also tend to see this go along hand in hand with other infections. So a lot of times, I'll see SIBO in combination with uh, fungal infection or um, parasitic infection. So it uh, usually doesn't come by itself. Um, we can diagnose it typically using breath testing. So um, there are certain labs that can do it, or you can purchase an in-office machine. Um, and basically, it will help to capture uh, the gaseous product that the bacterial overgrowth will release. So hydrogen methane gas when the patient is fasting. Um, you can also order other tests. There are other specialty labs that exist out there that may be able to collect a stool sample or urine sample and measure certain metabolites that come from some of the certain uh, intestinal bacteria. And if they're out of range, sometimes they can make an inferential diagnosis of SIBO. Typically, the treatment for this um, would be making sure that there's no other um, factor that's contributing to this. So if they were on some other type of antibiotic or they keep using it, if they have autoimmune diseases, we do want to help uh, control those because those are going to put them at a higher risk for the continuation of SIBO, which is already fairly difficult to treat. Um, anything to help improve uh, stomach acidity uh, can also be beneficial. So the addition of uh, hydrochloric acid into their diet um, 
can be helpful as well or uh, increased enzymes. Uh, but typically we're gonna give antibiotics. Um, so there is a large amount of resistance to antibiotics. So either if they were recently using antibiotics themselves um, or they've somehow collected this um, uh, over time, there's a high resistance to antibiotics. So I typically use um, uh, Zyfaxin or combination therapy of clindamycin metronidazole. Uh, typically speaking, the clindamycin metronidazole is, is gonna atomic bomb the entire gut. So you're gonna have a lot of cleanup work to do afterwards, um, but it can be very efficacious. Uh, typically spe speaking, I also have patients use a FODMAP diet um, or low FODMAP diet uh, to reduce the amount of inflammation and to cut off the food supply for the bacterial overgrowth while providing um, beneficial bacteria or probiotics that have had specific testing to show a commensal relationship in uh, an adult human or, or child. So um, certain uh, supplement companies will actually provide data and testing to show that um, they actually can do that. So candida um, uh, is arguably the most common gut infection, um, in my opinion. A lot of patients have it without having um, a significant diagnosis for it. It's very hard to test for. Um, risk factors typically are anything that decreases the immune system, so autoimmune conditions or low immune functions, um, prior or current antibiotic use that have gotten rid of their commensal bacteria or their innate defenses for it, um, patients who have diabetes since they simply just have more sugar in circulation or steroid use, um, if they have irritation or inflammation in the digestive tract, so one of the things we'll talk about a little later is leaky gut syndrome, and they have a tendency to have these crevices that form between the, the lumen. Um, and so they have uh, leaky junctions and candida has a high tendency to get stuck in there and just overgrow. A lot of common symptoms are gonna be gas and bloating, nausea. Typically they report acid reflux to varying degrees. Um, I typically see a little bit more on the diarrheal side. However, constipation can also be present Fatigue is probably one of the biggest things that I find with patients who have significant candida overgrowth. And the main reason for that is the candida is predominantly stealing most of the patient's nutrients. So um, I've had patients who have electrolyte imbalances because their candida is lining their uh, the lumen of their stomach and their uh, throughout their digestive tract. Brain fog is very common. Um, nutritional deficiencies, malabsorption of nutrients or medications. Um, recurrent UTIs or vaginal infections, anxiety, depression, insomnia, and rashes on the skin. So unresolving acne, eczema that um, doesn't seem to get any better with topical treatments. Um, and what uh, uh, the case study I will discuss later will kind of go into a more extensive um, explanation of kind of the presentation you may or may not see. Um, but I would say that this is fairly common. So if you're kind of digging for a reason for perhaps why your patient is suffering from brain fog or fatigue or having a lot of gas and bloating after eating, um, I would really consider candida. Um, diagnosis can be tough. Um, and sometimes even the buy-in with patients can be difficult because there is limited amounts of testing that can be done. Like I said, the patient has to pretty much be actively shedding um, the candida itself, either through some kind of natural um, treatment uh, that they're doing or through dietary changes, you're, it's unlikely you're gonna collect it on a stool sample. Um, on rare occasion with very significant uh, disease states, I'll have patients tell me that they're urinating mucus, that they're um, eliminating uh, mucus through their stool. Um, and you, sometimes they may capture um, uh, candidal clumps, which kind of vaguely resemble uh, cottage cheese. So you, you may have a patient who reports that, but not always. There is some breath testing that can be done. Um, you can collect a stool sample. There is blood testing that will look for um, metabolites or waste products that the candida will release. Um, so, but sometimes it's very difficult to, to find. Um, so it's about talking about the symptoms that your patient is having and um, sometimes them having a little bit of faith in the process um, but nine times out of 10, 
uh, it's usually if, if they have those symptoms, you're, you're right on the money with the candida. Treatment can be lengthy um, and there's a high chance of recurrence. Uh, a lot of it is um, we really have to cut off the food supply and candida or most funguses are very resilient. Um, so they can lie dormant. Um, in other cases of other types of fungus, they can also um, uh, create an increased biofilm or mucus layer over themselves that make them more resilient or resistant. Um, so, and really the key to kind of getting rid of this, so this is gonna help them with their symptoms, but sometimes looking at some of the, the approach to treating their underlying condition uh, could be something like leaky gut, but it could also be something like um, like their autoimmune condition. So it all pairs together. Um, so one of the things I use to help treat this is um, you can do it through um, supplements and dietary changes. It just takes an incredibly long period of time. Um, roughly, if I were to use uh, natural supplements and treatments, it's gonna take six months to a year uh, in order for the candida infection to resolve versus if I did utilize any type of medication, I could abridge that to a three to four week course of an antifungal, um, put them on a diet and probably see um, some resolution or significant improvement to their symptoms in 12 weeks. And then they can kind of start reincorporating certain foods um, back into their diet. So treatment can be quite lengthy. So um, whichever way the patient can always make the decision on what they think might be best. Um, most of the time, if when I explain the options to them, you know, six months to a year versus maybe three months, they tend to be rather agreeable to the medication. But, um, you know, it's every practitioner and every patient's decision on whether or not they would use it. Typically speaking, um, I have a protocol that I utilize um, in order to help the patients. Um, I typically have them start on a candida diet um, or FODMAP diet, either or low FODMAP. So no sugar, fermented foods, caffeine, um, nothing that could potentially have any um, fungus. And um, that's how I typically start them off. And then it's not usually until their third week into their diet that I actually introduce uh, antifungal medications. My statin and fluconazole are probably my most commonly used medications that I use for patients. And then I do a titration. So what's gonna end up happening when you do try to resolve um, SIBO, candida, any of these gut infections is they're gonna have a die off um, period of time in which they're going to be symptomatic of the treatment. Um, so what will end up happening is this is the predominant flora that's located in their gut. And what we said earlier about gut flora is that it produces most of our neurotransmitters. So what's going to end up happening is if I start trying to kill off these gut infections, um, they're going to start releasing neurotransmitters that's going to tell the patient that the, that the patient is dying but that's not actually the case. Um, it's simply the neurotransmitter messages that are getting sent from the candida as they are dying from our treatment. Um, usually passes in about three to five days of treatment. Um, however, uh, if that does occur with your patient, um, definitely investigate further, but most often it is simply the treatment and if they persist with the treatment, they will get through that period of time and eventually that thought process or sensation will go away. So this is a quick little slide, just kind of looking at the differences between the two diets. So one being a low FODMAP diet, the other being a candida diet. Candida diets are, are very restrictive. Um, not gonna beat around the bush. There's really not much that they can eat on the diet. However, um, a low FODMAP can be done for patients who may have some difficulty in finding meal choices on the candida diet. Um, it just may take a little bit longer. The whole basis of it is just to cut off the food supply for the candida. So we're taking one last thing to allow it to thrive away from them. In the last infection, I'm gonna talk about our parasitic infections. I'm not gonna go into one specifically, but just parasites in general. Um, so there can be one or several parasites present at once. Um, and occasionally um, they occur independently, but I would say they usually coexist uh, most often with fungal infections. Um, you may also see them perhaps with a, a bacterial infection as well, but nine times out of 10 um, that I have a patient with parasitic infections, they also have a coexisting fungal infection. And it's generally unclear which one existed first, but I would probably 
guess that the fungal infection uh, weakened some of the innate barriers and allowed for the parasitic infection to kind of take over. Um, parasites can come from a number of places, uh, contaminated foods. They're usually transmitted through oral fecal routes. Um, other bacterial or fungal infections could uh, decrease the immune system and place you at greater risk for a parasitic infection. Patients who are immunocompromised or age. Um, so typically we're looking at, you know, patients that would be less than five because they like to put everything in their mouth. So they have a higher tendency of catching parasitic infections. Um, generally adults are pretty good about minimizing that. Um, so some of the symptoms we might see could be weight loss. It could either be severe or minimal, um, diarrhea, uh, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, gas and bloating, although I would say generally a little less. Um, fatigue or weakness are, are pretty big, and then nutritional deficiencies, depending upon how long-lasting this parasitic infection has been there. Um, they, As you can see, a lot of the symptoms are very similar to that of candida, um, and mostly because candida does tend to have a very similar um, reaction or parasitic-like reaction inside of the body in, in terms of stealing nutrients. Um, for parasites, going to be kind of similar to the candida. Stool testing can be done. Um, there are limitations to testing. Unless you're shedding the parasite, you may not find it. Um, in an alternative realm, um, you can also do uh, frequency testing, um, and that can be done for uh, any of these infections um, where we can measure the various frequencies inside of the body and see if uh, an abnormal frequency exists, and that can determine um, if there's a parasite, perhaps what parasite, um, if there's some type of fungus and or bacterial infection. Um, some of my patients who have been significantly sick uh, have the, usually they have pretty much every type of infection you can think of. They usually have parasites, they usually have some type of fungus, if not multiple types of fungus, um, bacterial overgrowths and um, viral infections as well. So. Um, it's rare that you're gonna get a parasitic infection that's probably gonna be by itself, but you can do frequency testing. For treatments, it varies depending upon the type of parasite you're dealing with, but fairly typically we'd use things like albendazole, mebendazole, metro metronidazole. Um, dietary changes are generally recommended, um, like a low FODMAP diet, um, and then certain supplements and probiotics. Uh, it depends on the type of parasitic infection in terms of the supplement. Um, in the past, in some of the practices I've worked in, um, some uh, frequency testing or more advanced lab testing um, that can pick up on maybe a more specific subtype of parasite or fungus is recommended to help guide you on the type of supplementation that should be utilized. So some of the adjunctive treatments we'd look at for some of those things would be like I discussed earlier, the FODMAP or low FODMAP diet and or candida diet. Um, we're really looking at cutting off their food supply uh, primarily. Biofilm busters. Um, so uh, all types of uh, bacterial and fungal infections tend to make that nice mucus coating on top of them, which is why my patients will report to me that they're eliminating uh, mucus through multiple orifices. And so what we're looking at here are natural agents or medications that may help to thin those. Um, so it makes our treatment much more efficacious. Um, so if we're giving natural supplements, if we're modifying their diet, we're trying to get that out of there. Um, these are generally gonna help weaken some of the defenses of the difficult to kill infections. So uh, one of my favorites to use um, because it's easy to find, it's inexpensive, is extra virgin coconut oil. Um, and usually I just have them take a heaping tablespoonful a um, couple times a day. Not the most pleasant taste experience, but it definitely works at thinning that out. And uh, they also have the added benefit of caprylic acid, which is an additional um, antimicrobial function that they have. Um, turmeric also can help with reducing tumor necrosis factor um, and inflammation. Um, apple cider vinegar can be used, especially for things like SIBO or upper GI conditions. Um, and then if all else fails or your patient just simply tells you they don't want to do any of those things or they're too expensive, we can always refer them to use mucinex, which its intended purpose is to thin mucus secretions. We typically think of it for respiratory, but actually thins um, digestive secretions as well. So that will work not only on the mucus we produce, but the mucus that the uh, infective agent will produce. 
uh, antimicrobials, natural antimicrobials include berberine, oregano, wormwood. Um, so berberine and oregano, we typically use more for fungal infections, wormwood, black walnut hull, um, garlic, uh, those can be used for parasitic. Uh, garlic can actually be used for a wide variety of infections. Um, ginger can be fairly effective. Golden seal we can use for certain bacterial and viral infections. Thyme is antiviral as well. And then clove um, has some, a multitude of antimicrobial properties. Probiotics, it really depends on the type of infection. Um, typically speaking, we're gonna wanna give them a really high potency, so 100 billion plus CFUs. Um, there are some companies that make you know, 200 billion CFUs, 250 billion CFUs. So we're looking for high variability in the strains that they've been shown to be efficacious in um, humans in terms of a commensal relationship. And then they can also be, um, they can help to force out other infections. So, um, you know, there's brands that I typically like to use. Um, I don't necessarily throw them into my presentations, but if, in the questions and answers, if you guys um, wanted to go through what I typically use, then we can definitely do that. Um, but they typically are gonna need a really high dose and they're gonna probably take it a couple times a day. So uh, most often, um, depending upon what type of infection they have and what their treatment plan is, uh, probiotics should be given typically on an empty stomach. Um, so one hour before food or two hours after and at least twice a day while they're going through some type of active treatment. And while this is not everyone's favorite topic, um, they can be pretty effective at helping patients. So um, enemas in a variety of types, uh, you could do a tap water enema, but that's not going to do much for helping to get rid of any of the waste products um, or the infections. Um, typically, we can use things like coffee enemas, and those are highly detoxifying. Um, they just simply help to pull additional fluid into the bowels, and with fluid come waste products and toxins. So that's going to help us to eliminate garlic, as I mentioned, is highly antimicrobial and can definitely help with that. Chlorophyll, I think of as a natural internal sponge. So whatever waste products exist in there, it's a good idea to hold on to them and get them out as soon as possible. So, and clay works in a very similar way. So for the most part, we would consider those more of binding agents. And generally during most of these treatments, I do recommend either one way or the other, either through an enema or through a supplement that the patient takes, they should be on some type of binding agent because as these infections die off, they're gonna release a large amount of endotoxin. And as that endotoxin gets released, the patient will develop things like flu-like symptoms. So they'll have headaches, they'll feel fatigued or tired, they'll have myalgias, arthralgias, um, they could have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, so they could have a presentation of being very severely sick. So the binding agents are going to help to grab a hold of the endotoxin and help to release it. Um, other types of uh, binding agents could be things like activated charcoal, psyllium husk, things of that nature. So just a little quick nursing humor on enemas. Um, surprise, it's enema time, everyone's favorite time. And if you're looking for the patient with the bowel problem, I think they went that way. So moving on a little bit to food allergies. So food allergies um, can be somewhat debatable in the sense of are they a true allergy or are they a symptom um, of some other underlying condition like a candida infection, a parasitic infection, um, or something like leaky gut, which we are getting to. Um, and so food allergies can be mild to moderate. So we can see things uh, in terms of symptomology like uh, runny nose, rhinorrhea, cough, nausea, acid reflux, diarrhea, constipation, or rashes, and that can be um, both internal and external rashes. Um, and then moderate to severe could be vomiting, um, significant eczema or psoriasis, chronic fatigue syndrome, autoimmune conditions, and or anaphylaxis. So the onset of symptoms could be gradual and over time, they could be all of a sudden. So it, there's a high degree of variability depending upon the severity of the food allergy and particularly what the underlying cause or, or condition is. Um, there is a high risk for food sensitivities or allergies in the presence of infections. So I always try to make sure that if a patient comes in and they have a high degree of true or true appearing food allergies or food sensitivities. Um, so if you run that food sensitivity panel or they go and do scratch testing and they seem like they're allergic to everything, chances are they're probably not, although they could be. 
chances are there's something else underlying probably in the gut in which um, the gut has been compromised and now it's completely overreactive to everything it comes in contact with. So um, when I see that, I typically want to make sure that the gut structure itself is intact and whole. Um, so we want to make sure that we're doing that. So we're, we're going to see changes to overall immune health um, with those types of patients, and we'll see changes to gut structure. Um, like I mentioned, we can do um, scratch testing because there's high amounts of IgE located in our um, external skin as well. You can do blood testing. Um, typically, the ones that you're going to run through are common labs like LabCorp, Quest, um, any of the other major national chains. Um, they're not very sensitive. So unless your patient practically has an anaphylactic reaction to something, you're probably not going to see it on one of their lab tests. There are some companies that run more specific uh, sensitivity testing in the blood. Um, so for your patients who absolutely hate needles and would rather have one poke with a blood test rather than 30 to 60 pokes with a skin scratch test, um, then that would be a good alternative to use those types of labs. Um, so, but you have to use a more specific lab um, that's more sensitive um, and typically is not gonna be covered through your insurance. Medications we can use to manage it, um, worth mention. So obviously renantadine is um, not currently uh, very active on the market. There's famotidine to replace that, loratadine. Um, Monolucist is one of the ones I really like, especially for my patients with um, uh, upper respiratory type symptoms that come along with their food allergies or patients who have um, external rashes, so eczema or psoriasis. I tend to like to use uh, monolucist um, if necessary. And then we can also use steroids. You know, it's always an option for management anytime we're looking at some type of allergy treatment. Um, but ideal is to stay away from that. Um, our goal is really not to suppress the immune system per se. Um, only We're only using medications until maybe we can get on top of what the underlying cause is. So it's, like I said, it's pretty rare that you have a patient who's truly allergic to all these foods and there isn't some other underlying issue going on. Adjunctive treatment could be um, antigen injections or desensitization, where essentially speaking, the patient gives them a small dose of the food allergens and over time, their body will stop responding to it. 100% um, of the time, I absolutely recommend to my patients, we need to take care of whatever the underlying condition is if there is one existing. So specifically an infection or leaky gut syndrome, um, an autoimmune condition. So whatever the case may be, we definitely need to take care of that either temporarily or long-term, looking at food elimination diets or avoidance of certain triggers or foods. Um, my most favorite um, adjunctive uh, or supplements that I use in my treatments for my patients are quercetin. Um, it's a natural antihistamine um, and it works great. Uh, turmeric is another fantastic one to help with uh, the tumor necrosis factor and helping with inflammation um, throughout the body. Great for um, airway management and control too. Stinging nettle is another good one. And there are several others that you can get um, in a multiple formulation. So you can get a supplement that has all of those in them um, to varying degrees. Um, and there's a variety of companies that will sell those, but you can also buy them independently or have your patients get them independently. So leaky gut, um, taking a quick look here at what ends up happening inside of our system. So essentially leaky gut syndrome is an inflammatory reaction inside of our gut um, where something has occurred, um, some type of initial injury uh, could have been an episode of uh, traveler's diarrhea or it could have been um, you know, an infection like we mentioned. Somehow or another, these cells became compromised and inflamed and they stopped doing their normal jobs. So if we look on the left, you can see the transport of vitamins and minerals. Um, there's a healthy regulation of what can come in and what goes out. Um, there's a blockage of in infections, um, food particles that shouldn't be going in there. The cell membranes are nice and tight, um, so they have good uh, discernment or discretion of what's coming or going uh, into our bloodstream. Unfortunately, um, certain things can affect that. So, you know, infections over time or chronic infections can definitely weaken those and they can invade and cause these uh, nooks, crannies, and crevices in between. Um, and we call these leaky junctions, which is why um, the term leaky gut syndrome. So certain medications, stress, poor diet, 
um, can all influence this. Um, so in many cases, you know, our standard American diet, nicknamed SAD because it truly is, um, tends to cause to a lot uh, cause a lot of inflammation in the bowel and um, in which case it can allow for these infections to come and set up. As you can see, there's not really much discretion or discernment from those cells. They're not able to do their full job um, and things can just end up in the bloodstream, which is why we can see an increase to things like food sensitivities um, or reactions to foods. Um, we'll end up seeing more problems with um, with skin over time um, because that's going to be a reflection of how well we're absorbing um, nutrients. Um, and then we're also going to see a huge increase in risk for autoimmune diseases. So um, typically uh, things like Hashimoto's, MS, RA, um, IBS, lupus. So uh, a lot of those are correlated to having a degree of leaky gut syndrome, either uh, minor or severe. So it's chronic inflammation and the luminal cells are destroyed. There's a disruption in the integrity of the intestines, a change to the permeability. Um, so uh, again, uh, there's an uh, absorption of toxins or waste products that can happen. So things that your body would have typically been getting rid of in your stool now can't get rid of, which is why when we're trying to help repair this, things like binding agents are so important. So those toxins and waste aren't reabsorbed back into the system and can cause various degrees of organ damage. Um, there's an increased risk for the development of autoimmune conditions. Um, as you can see, there's gonna likely be um, a dysregulation to the immune system since uh, one of our biggest immune um, organs, essentially speaking, is so compromised. So that's why we're going to end up seeing such systemic results. Um, could also participate in the development of things like cancer. So um, in a lot of cancer patients, it's good to assess to see if there is leaky gut. Most often they do have infections. Um, very frequently I've seen um, uh, you can have overt uh, yeast infections, like your patients with oral thrush, um, or you can have people with more discrete findings. But um, very commonly, I'll see uh, candida or fungal infections in cancer patients, um, but you can also find them before their development too. There's definitely nutrient malabsorption, which is going to perpetuate some of the other problems going on. You'll, we'll see food and environmental allergies kick up, like I said, um, and their immune system is pretty much completely shot. Um, they also tend to have a high tendency towards um, things like anxiety, depression, insomnia, um, Typically, these patients are very anxious um, and uh, have a hard time uh, being able to focus, lots of brain fog. Um, there's not really a specific diagnostic test at this time. Uh, if you were to go in and do a colonoscopy or an EGD, you may not see anything. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you would have some overt findings like that. Um, this is typically a, a symptom review and kind of looking through your patient's history. Um, so, you know, typically speaking, uh, it's going to be based on your judgment and assessment of your patient. Um, and it requires a very multifaceted approach towards um, resolving what's going on. So I always like to make sure that there's no infections before I go into um, what I call gut repair. Um, so I test my patients for any infections before I move forward with that because I would hate to have an infection get covered up by any type of repair. I'm trying to do the intestinal wall. Um, and then just locking that in. So the patient will continue to have these symptoms. They'll keep coming back. So um, I could do gut repair for eight weeks or four weeks and um, the patient will feel better. And then I let them go home and do their own thing. And then they'll come back in uh, 10, 12 weeks and tell me that all of their symptoms have come back. Maybe they're even worse than before because now I've locked that infection into their gut. So always double check for infections before um, doing any major gut repair. Um, and then dietary changes are usually necessary, like, like a low FODMAP diet. Um, you can use medications depending upon what's going on with the patient, um, and then definitely supplements and vitamins. So um, always make sure that there's no um, offending agent before you do any repair. Um, I always encourage some degree of dietary change, just depends on what's going on with your patient. After you've made sure there's no infections and you've put them on a, a clear cut diet that's gonna reduce overall inflammation, then I like to um, 
help by reestablishing a healthy mucus lining as well as helping to support um, the formation of new cells. So um, things that really help with building mucus or building up the, the epithelial cells in the gut are things like aloe vera, um, slippery elm really helps a lot with mucus. Um, glutamine can be used, but you have to be really cautious with it. Um, anyone that could have some inkling of cancer, glutamine can actually cause it to grow. So we have to be careful with glutamine, but otherwise works really well. Um, well I typically will put them on some type of anti-inflammatory herbs to kind of help with the repair and recovery of the epithelial or luminal cells. Um, so turmeric, quercetin, a combination of bioflavonoids, ginger, um, NATO kinase and lumbo kinase um, combinations are a real quick way to cut down on inflammation because they're going to go right to the source and de degrade the um, inflammatory cytokines. Um, Boswellia uh, works really well and DL phenylalanine. Um, typically, you can also find several of these in uh, a complex. So multiple supplement companies make these as a combination altogether. The only ones you probably won't find in um, in something like that might be something like natal kinase or lumbo kinase, uh, mostly because uh, they could lose some of their activity if they're combined in a multiple formulation. I do like to give my patients branch chain amino acids um, to help rebuild and repair. Um, also because in many cases they're nutrient deficient and could have had some muscle wasting or things of that nature. And then I'm gonna to wanna to pull um, additional waste products out of them because they've been reabsorbing all of these waste products for a long period of time. So um, uh, detoxification is just a fancy term that we use for that, but N-acetylcysteine, milk thistle, artichoke, they're all gonna to help to increase endogenous production of glutathione, um, dandelion root, burdock root. They're gonna to help to increase um, uh, renal clearance um, and urine production so that we can utilize another system to help get rid of those. You can use glutathione, but unless you're giving it IV, it's probably going to degrade before you get any real use out of it. Um, you can inject it intramuscularly or subcutaneously, but um, generally speaking, uh, I would say that it's not as efficacious um, as something like IV. You're better off with a precursor like N-acetylcysteine, silymarin, or artichoke extract. And then cilantro is really great for anyone who's suspected to have um, heavy metals. Uh, on that same note, we can also use other strategies like saunas, hot tubs, um, hot showers um, to help pull those waste products out. Uh, typically, if I have a patient who's unable to do that or we're doing things at home right now because of the whole uh, COVID situation, foot baths or foot detoxes are actually really great to help pull additional waste products out as well. And then usually I give some degree of digestive support depending upon their symptomology. So we can give pancreatic enzymes with meals, um, ox bile, uh, HCL, any of those to help them. So that the gut can have a little bit of a break and rest. So some more uh, specific treatments or additional adjunctive treatments we can use in different conditions. Let's say we've ruled out the potential or possibility of an infection or the patient has no desire in going down that pathway, we can definitely do some symptom management. So with GERD, we'd probably give some digestive enzymes, um, amylase, lipase, uh, hydrochloric acid, ox bile, just depending upon how significant their problem is and what foods may be triggers for them. Nausea and vomiting, um, wanna make sure there's no infectious agent that's causing that, but otherwise things like activated charcoal, peppermint helps increase the production of bile, um, lemon balm is very calming and soothing. Aloe vera is going to help to calm and soothe any irritated epithelial luminal cells. Um, and then probiotics is going to help um, repopulate our digestive tract with the appropriate gut flora so we can prevent um, any further reinfection. Um, acne, they can use topical treatments like tea tree oil, sulfur, ozones. Um, typically speaking, I do have them do a degree of diet modification depending upon how significant and then we're also gonna to wanna to make sure we do a full hormone panel and evaluation and make sure that there's no allergies that could be contributing to this and or other internal infections. Um, and then cancer, um, like I mentioned before, um, they typically have a lot of gut infections. Um, they are usually not absorbing things very well. Uh, they typically need pancreatic enzymes or proteolytic enzymes to help break down some of the inflammatory proteins inside the body. Um, can also help while they're undergoing cancer treatments like chemotherapy and or radiation treatments. 
the pancreatic enzymes will help to weaken um, some of the membranes on the cancer cells. Um, they definitely need a degree of nutritional support um, and vitamins is necessary, but be cautious dependent upon the type of cancer the patient has. Probiotics are hugely beneficial for them. And then uh, a lot of this is really variable dependent upon their stage, location, the type of cancer. Um, and in almost all cancers, we're going to avoid glutamine at all costs possible. So I have a couple case studies. I know we're getting closer to our period of time here. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and refer to um, ACAM here and see if they want me to continue on with the case studies. Um, or if you want to move into the question and answer. Uh, yes, go ahead and uh, finish with the case studies. We uh, have a few questions popping up, but if you could just breeze over those, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so the first one here, um, DC, she's a 37-year-old female. Um, she came to me. She had complaints of a rash that just wouldn't go away for over a year. She had tried most things, um, and we'll go through her prior treatments. Um, but she keeps getting, getting progressively worse. In fact, she ended up being hospitalized on multiple occasions for sepsis. Um, she has unresolved vaginitis and cystitis. Um, she reports moist dandruff and worsening food sensitivities, um, frequent nausea and constipation. Her food allergies uh, include, but are not limited to, they continue to grow fish, stone fruit, um, gluten, um, some issues with dairy. She had asthma with poor control to, um, regardless of the medications given. Uh, she was pre-diabetic, incredibly anxious, um, horrible insomnia, and um, report difficulty conceiving. Um, I was not in charge of her uh, OB care, so I couldn't get into any further details on that. Um, she had had a prior cholecystectomy. Um, so she tried multiple rounds of antibiotics for more than three months. Like I mentioned, she was hospitalized, put on IV antibiotics. Um, she changed all the lotions, detergents, clothing to cotton. She put new air filters into the house. She tried to modify her diet for her sensitivities. She'd used common um, over-the-counter anti-dandruff shampoo, but nothing seemed to make it any better. Just anytime she would step out of the shower and scratch her head, just pieces of, of moist dandruff, as she would describe it, would come out. Um, she's unable to tolerate monoleucus. She said it just made her anxiety that much worse. Um, and the vaginal infections were unresponsive to nystatin and had limited responsiveness to metronidazole. Um, it took quite a while to convince this patient that she had an underlying candida infection um, and that what she was in fact scratching off the top of her head were bits of candida. Um, so uh, once she had a degree of buy-in, um, we started her on a candida diet so I, I typically give my patients a 12-week course, so they start on their candida diet. Um, I had her start on antifungal supplements, which also includes biofilm busters, um, usually a degree of berberine, oregano. Um, usually uh, I have them start taking garlic or increase their intake of garlic as well. And then they do three weeks of an antifungal medication. In her case, I gave fluconazole and I do a titration. So if I give her a super high dose all at once, her symptoms of uh, the die off will be really great. Um, and so um, I do a, a three week titration um, and then I keep them on a relatively high dose once a day um, for about two weeks. Uh, and then after that period of time, we start working on some gut repair. So I introduce probiotics usually in the last week of the antifungal medication. And then they continue that on for the completion of the full 12 week period um, and then work on gut repair after they've gotten rid of the infection. And so that usually includes all of the supplements I had listed before um, to varying degrees. Um, there are some manufacturers who make a product that um, will kind of be an all-in-one. So I find that they're very useful in helping to treat patients. Really helps increase compliance. And then my last one, um, SE, she's a 23-year-old female. She had severe eczema, um, nearly complete coverage of both bilateral upper and lower extremities. She had areas of bleeding. Um, her skin was so dry and cracked. Um, she came into my office crying. Um, she had it on her torso, uh, recurrent upper respiratory tract infections, and she was a restaurant uh, worker. Um, but because of the, the soaps that they had to use to cleanse the table and because she had to wash her hands regularly, they were so sore, irritated, and bleeding. Um, that she wasn't able to work anymore. 
Uh, she also uh, had a very stressful school event that precipitated this massive flare and um, really changed the intensity and severity of her symptoms. Uh, past medical history, she had seasonal allergies that were becoming worse. Um, she had been diagnosed with a gluten sensitivity um, and a few other mild food allergies that she didn't pay much attention to. And then recurrent URI and ear infections as a child with frequent antibiotic use. No prior surgeries. So we tried her on citrazine, dietary changes, all natural soaps, emollient creams. She started putting topical coconut oil to try to hydrate her skin. She'd done topical steroids, antibiotics for the bleeding lesions. There was no improvement. Um, so she originally declined um, very aggressive treatments and didn't want to take any medications. And she just wanted to see if it would get better. Uh, it didn't. So we started her on monolucist and some natural anti-inflammatories and she had some minor improvement. Um, she developed a sinus infection and while on treatment, her eczema became worse because we were giving her antibiotics. Um, she started on two weeks of oral steroids and um, she agreed to major dietary changes. Uh, I actually think she went and saw her rheumatologist um, who <laughs> stated that uh, she needed the steroids to calm the flare down, but that was not the ultimate treatment. And I think that's when she finally had buy-in. She's also pretty young, so the candida diet is a little scary for them. Um, but uh, she she did start it. I put her on my 12-week program, um, and then she also started um, some dietary supplements to help with her multiple nutritional deficiencies. But um, underlying was a massive candida infection. As soon as we helped to clear and treat that, um, her skin uh, started clearing, and by the end of the 12 weeks, uh, you could barely tell she even had eczema. And that's that. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we do have a few questions, so I'm going to go ahead and read these off for you. Uh, so the, the first question that we have is coming from Ms. Hewitt, and the question is, uh, I believe it's in relation to the parasitic slides, mm -hmm. uh, and what is frequency testing? So frequency testing is essentially speaking, they would use uh, two electrodes um, or probes. Um, uh, and what they'll do is they'll check the frequency as it runs through the body. So it's an electrical conduction through the body. And um, uh, there's been some uh, research that's been done at distinguishing what the normal frequencies are as they run through our body. So um, uh, using biomeridian points, on our hands and our feet, we can determine um, what electrical current we should see running through different organ systems. And those biomeridians have been set up by uh, the practices of things like acupuncture. So we know that there are specific correlations to them. Um, someone actually sat down and, and figured out um, what frequency each organ system should be. Um, but also we know that different types of bacterial infections um, or bacteria in general, viruses, um, protozoans, they all have different frequencies. And so doing this frequency testing, we can determine what might be underlying based on the frequency it's emitting. So we can tell that it's abnormal. It's not what should be going through the body system. We can tell the strength or severity of it. And um, we can usually determine at least a, a, a general class of what type of infective agent might be present. All right. And uh, the next question we have uh, is, how does glutamine act in promoting activity in cancer cells? So glutamine, um, glutamine is generally um, a, a fortification that we'll find in a, a various or various types of cells inside of the body. Um, generally speaking, it's not so much that it has a different sense of activity in cancer cells, but we definitely wouldn't want to give anything that's going to influence um, or increase their productivity or strengthen the cancer cells. So that's why we typically avoid the use of glutamine um, in cancer patients. Uh, we just don't want to get, we don't want to fuel the fire, basically. And the next question being, what supplement contains nat uh, natokinase? natokinase and lumbokinase? So uh, natokinase and lumbokinase, yeah. Um, so there's a variety of different um, products and manufacturers. Um, uh, if it, I believe uh, a lot of the larger companies, so companies like Zymogen, um, Metagenics, um, probably have one 
you know, lumbokinase or natokinase. Um, there's a product that exists that has a variety of different um, uh, proteolytic enzymes. Um, and off the top of my head right now, I cannot recall the name. Um, I can look into it and um, I'm sure there's a way we could communicate that out. Um, but uh, um, in the past, um, also there are other companies, um, I very commonly use Wobenzyme, um, which is by uh, um, Garden of Life. Um, and they ha and there are a variety of proteolytic enzymes. I believe they have natokinase and lumbrokinase in them. Um, but lumbrokinase is a little bit more specific in that it works on the endothelium of the vessels as well. So it helps to cut down on vascular inflammation. And so that can be very helpful. And our last question today is, uh, is it oregano for Candida TX? Yeah, so oregano can be utilized. I typically don't use it by itself. I use a combination of things, but oregano is almost always utilized unless the patient has an allergy, in which case we'll find a workaround for that. Um, but most formulations you'll find, um, orthomolecular, Zymogen, um, several of the large manufacturers do make um, a candida specific uh, type of product. And so it typically has oregano, berberine, um, and a variety of others just depending upon which company it is. But those are almost always synonymous for candida treatment. And it looks like we have uh, another question, which is, does glutamine exist naturally in food or only supplement? Uh, can it affect breast cancer cells? So glutamine does exist in our food. It's an amino acid. So um, it's one of the byproducts we can get from some of the foods that we eat. Uh, typically speaking, um, it could potentially in influence uh, you know, breast cancer cells. Um, it, it's not that it only stays in the gut. You know, these are dispensed wherever the need is in the body based on the signals that it sends. But um, typically speaking, a lot of times for cancer patients, uh, it's recommended that they go on you know, healthier diets are going to cut out a lot of the junk food, which could have some higher amounts of glutamine. But typically speaking, um, like really high protein diets are going to have a lot more glutamine in them and present because amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So the more protein, probably more glutamine in general you'll have. So um, in many cases, uh, for most types of cancer, um, the recommendations are on a more, you know, um, naturopathic or allopathic type of treatment plan, we typically recommend ketogenic, which is a higher fat-based content um, with a moderate to low amount of protein, um, and then things like fruits and vegetables. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nurse Practitioner Ariel Kazi. Uh, we really appreciate you coming through uh, and uh, going in depth on this presentation. Uh, I, I know you have that last slide for citations uh, I don't know if you want to put that up there. Sure. So to everyone who's attending, we're going to be sending out the recording of this session, uh, as well as the slides for, for everyone's access, as well as uh, for the reference. Uh, but we want to go ahead and thank you once again for being on uh, for this afternoon. And uh, any closing remarks for the ACAM members? Uh, I just encourage you all to... Um you know, thoroughly investigate what's going on with your patients um, before fully committing to a plan as much as you can. Um, should you need additional guidance, um, uh, I'm sure that we can help to provide uh, a contact for me if you had any other questions outside of this chat here. Um, but it's a very complex issue. Uh, it took many years to get to a point, um, and this is through the development. Uh, I've worked through all of these things with other practitioners other people who've been doing this for a very long time, nutritionists um, and uh, specialists to really get this fine-tuned. Um, and obviously this is only looking at a certain subsection of what could be going on in the gut. So there are a lot of other things, but in my opinion, there's usually almost always something underlying and many times I find infection. So that's why I chose to focus in on this. Um, but everyone has their own strategies and practice and this is just one of them. So I appreciate all of your time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for coming, as well as all ACAM members. And uh, we look forward to connecting you uh, with our next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.